provision, which is 130 year old provision. Thomas Paine, when he deals, when he talks of the rights of man in his famous treatise, in response to the charge of seditious, seditious libel, as it was called, says this, and I quote, if to expose the fraud and imposition of monarchy, to promote universal peace, civilization and commerce, and to break the chains of political superstition, and to raise degraded man to his proper rank, if these things are to be libelous, let the name of libeler be engraved. Democracy, friends, entails and requires open discussion. It contains and emphasizes the citizen's right to debate, to question through his, his or her representatives, whether in parliament or in the legislative assemblies, and even otherwise directly, which is the questions which we now term civil society often asks governments. Article 19 enables us to recognize fundamental right of speech and expression, the right to question, the right to debate, the right to confer, and the right to disseminate your own thoughts. John Stuart Mill, in his Liberty and Utilitarianism, talks about the importance of freedom of speech and expression. But in India, while we have this right, we also have reasonable restrictions under Article 19.2 of the Constitution. Now this provision, sedition, which we're going to talk about today, and there's a very interesting interplay between sedition and the right to freedom of speech and expression, is a colonial tool of ancient vintage. The Statute of Westminster in Great Britain, in England, in the year 1275, when we had kings, we had rulers, and we had the concept of divine right of rulership of kings, brought about this because that was a purely and totally feudal society. So section 124A of the Indian Penal Code, as it stands, talks about create, you know, words spoken or written which incite hatred, contempt, and disaffection. Now, what is disaffection? Disaffection is the opposite of affection. This offense, as Siddharth Gupta said, is cognizable, and this is very important. The fact that the police can arrest without a warrant. This amendment was brought in only as late as 1978, though the statute has been around since the year 1800 and this provision has been around since the year 1870. It's a serious offense. The punishment can be anywhere between three years to life sentence and it falls within a chapter of the Indian Penal Code, a wonderful interesting legislation of the 1860s or 1860s specifically. Chapter 6 which deals with number one, waging war, collecting arms, conspiracy to collect arms and all these acts, the other acts apart from sedition, are all acts which deal with, which have a propensity to violence. Sedition, therefore, will have to be understood in the context also of the chapter that that's, it is in, that's chapter 6 of the IPC. There are, of course, other provisions, as I said, section 121 to 124, waging war, etc. And there are sister provisions, I would say, in the IPC dealing with acts not seditious but similar, which are punishable, for example, 153A, which deals with promoting caste enmity, race enmity, etc. 153B, statements detrimental to national integration. 295A, outraging religious feelings. 505, statements promoting enmity between different categories of people. Now, all these are a large body of laws, and the reason I'm introducing this large number of provisions is because the question that we're going to ask ourselves today, and perhaps someday again, you will ask this question in courts or elsewhere. How relevant is sedition, sedition in, a, in a country which is a democratic republic where the only sovereign are the citizens of India and not any external ruler or emperor? Now, this provision is fascinating from another point of view. Not only is the act itself an offense, but even an attempt is punishable. So, for example, if you were to make a speech which is 
yet recorded but not uh, distributed or if you were to uh, draft an article which before its publication is ready but is about to be published and is sent to the printer even that attempt can be made punishable if you send it to let's say uh, newspaper distributors to distribute an article and it's seditious but it's not yet distributed even that attempt can be punishable and therefore this makes it an act a defense of the widest possible uh, widest possible implications historically one of the classic cases that i have read of is the trial of socrates as you know socrates lived in the year 300 bc and he was charged at that time with corrupting the youth practicing religious novelties and neglecting the gods of the time he was brought before a city assembly court with 500 jurors the majority voted that he be punished uh, by and he was given a death sentence uh, And that's the most important part which we need to deal with. So all Socrates does is, Socrates tells his young students, question, reasons must be asked. We must question why certain norms exist in our society. And if questioning was the reason was an offense, then today itself in a democracy, we cannot apply a parameter of more than 2,300 years ago. We have to look forwards and see, are we living in a modern society where we have, where the right to knowledge, where the right to dissemination of information is a fundamental right, is a basic right of human beings. So Socrates is put to death. And when he is about to drink the cup of hemlock, he says these words and I'll quote them. I would rather die having spoken after my manner than to speak your manner and live and that friends was the trial of socrates 300 bc after this we had a number of famous indian cases let me tell you about the indian cases as i told you uh, just to give you a little background I, I i missed that part you know this uh the offense of sedition was not there in the original code it was but in the draft code, in 80, it was section 113 clause 113 of the draft code, but not kept in the original IPC in 1816. It was later brought in in the year 1870 because of certain reasons, which I will just dwell upon a little later. And since then, it's been on our uh, statute book. It has been amended, overhauled in 1898, but we'll come to that a little later. So the famous Indian cases of sedition are, amongst others are, Bal Ganga Dhartilak, Dr. Aurobindo Ghosh, and in recent times, Dr. Vinayak Sen and Kadhaiya Kumar. The fact that sedition is being increasingly used becomes apparent from the fact that in the year 2014, and I'm telling you figures from the National Crime Records Bureau, you had 47 cases in 2014, 30 reported in 2015, but by 2018, you had 70 such cases. In 2020, 3,000 protesters against the Citizenship Amendment Bill Act and Bill were prosecuted for sedition. And it's interesting because most of the contentions that they have raised are the contentions which are, which are part of the petitions which are pending in the Supreme Court, which will hopefully be adjudicated once the court reopens to full functioning and the matter is heard. Similarly, 3,300 farmers were charged with sedition earlier for protesting about land disputes however on the conviction side since 2016 we have only four recorded convictions for an offensive sedition in 2017 the national crimes record bureau has started a new mechanism it now categorizes certain class of cases as anti-national act activities or violence by anti-national elements and those are violence by Northeast insurgents, by jihadi terrorists, by Naxalites and other terrorists. And these are 1,112 cases registered in the year 2018 alone. A 19 year old Bangalore student has recently been charged with sedition for raising slogans while protesting against the Citizenship Amendment Bill. Now I must tell you that frankly, the law has been clarified and explained very beautifully 
way back in 1995 and 97, following the classical Supreme Court decision of Kedar Nath Singh of 1962, which I'm going to deal with a little later. The problem we face is we as Indians are rather thin skinned. We take umbrage too early, and sometimes criticism of a functionary is treated as a personal attack, things which should rather be in the domain of defamation, if at all in the domain of criminal defamation, are being treated as seditious activities. And recently, I had occasion to do a case uh, before the Supreme Court, the matter is now pending in the Tamil Nadu, uh, in the Madras High Court, of a magazine called Nakiran. Now, the editor of Nakiran published something which was not very complimentary of the Honorable the Governor of Tamil Nadu. And he was prosecuted for sedition. He goes to the High Court. The High Court says there is no such sedition. There is, there is no such sedition made out in this case. The High Court stays it. And the Supreme Court stayed the High Court order. It took us seven to eight months, maybe a little longer. I think it was nine months before the Supreme Court decided the SLP. And meantime, the man's trial was going on for an offense for which he should not have been charged. Finally, the Supreme Court has accepted our petition. The matter has been remanded to the High Court and it will be reconsidered by the High Court in the near future whenever courts open. As I was saying, there are two classic cases. One is of Balwan Singh and one is of Bilal Anod Kalu, 95 and 97. Now, these are important cases because both of these cases were people who were raising slogans against the government of the day. In both cases, there were prosecutions, but the Supreme Court very clearly said, mere raising of slogans is not enough. Something more is needed. The fact that you object to actions of the government is not enough, and therefore that's not a ground to invoke the offensive sedition. Yet, in 2019, a student who puts out a Facebook post is put in custody for four months before he gets bail. And again, a 22-year-old Mumbai student in a protest on LGBTQ uh, protest raises certain slogans and is prosecuted, arrested, and put to judicial custody remand. Historically, sedition was a tool by our colonial masters to restrain natives, people like you and me. And this anachronism carried on even post-independence, so much so that for those of you who are lawyers here, you will recall that when you did your, got your sanat, you would have had to fill a form. My late father, when he became a lawyer under the 1926 Act, though he became a lawyer in 1949, he had to give an undertaking and his certificate record that there is an undertaking that the bearer of the certificate will not indulge in any seditious activity. So even the 1926 Act required this restriction on lawyers, which is, as I said, an anachronism and peculiar post the Constitution and definitely post independence, because at that time there were no kings, no masters, and no colonial rulers. I've told you the history of uh, the Act, the provision. It had to come in in the 1860 Act, gets missed out. But meanwhile, in or about 1870, the Viceroy, Lord Mayo, and one Justice Norman of the Calcutta High Court get killed, and sedition is brought in with one explanation. Later on, this offense gets amended to a great extent, and that happens in 1898 when it comes in its current form. Now, we must also consider that what is this offense all about? Why has it how is it developed? So let me tell you a little history about some of the classical cases that were discussed before the constitution comes in. The first state trial was Jogendra Chandra Bose, 1892, it's a classical decision. There was a magazine called Bango Basi, a weekly newspaper where certain material considered seditious was published. The proprietor, editor, manager are prosecuted. They say that the imperial masters are trying to impose Europeanized India. And there was the issue was regarding increasing the age of consent for sexual intercourse to 12 years. And that was the objection. And that the British are conquering India, they're colonizing India, they're Europeanizing India. And that was the protest. The man was, uh, was prosecuted and put to trial. The ju jury cannot, use, cannot reach a unanimous verdict. Meanwhile, the accused tender an apology and they get away. The second important case, friends, 
is Bal Ganga Tilak, the 1898 trial. This is regarding the publications in the magazine Kesri, where Tilak Saab was the proprietor and publisher. He published two articles. One was Shivaji's utterances, and this was about what would Shivaji feel if he came to India today and saw that we were a colonized race. The second one was a, was a report on a meeting held on 13 June 1897. He was prosecuted, and in the meantime, two officials, Rand and Ayers, two British officials, important British officials, were murdered, and it was believed that they were murdered as a result of Mr. Tilak's article. Tilak is charged for exciting the feeling of disaffection against government established by law in India. That's a very interesting thing. This government of the British was not by law. It was a government by force. It is that the British came in, removed the ruling dispensation, the Mughal emperor, took over the other princely families, made them subordinates, entered into treaties. We all know what those treaties were, you, especially our friends in Madhya Pradesh know, the way the principalities had to be reduced to subservient principalities. And then they claim to be established by law, and that becomes the basis for invoking such offenses. Now, this case becomes a very starting point of a critical interpretation of 124A because the word disaffection is now being interpreted. This is now said to, and it's a very wide interpretation given. It's Disaffection is said to include hatred, ill will, enmity, dislike, contempt, and every form of hostility, any form of hostility. So this expansion in Tilak's case leads to a greater application of the offense of sedition by a colonial judicial uh, system. After Tilak's case, you had another classic decision, which is Ramachandra Narayan, 1898-22 Bombay Law Reporter. There was a magazine called Prathod. It wrote certain articles, again, alleged to have caused disaffection, again prosecuted, because what was the article about? The article was that Canada at that time was becoming independent, and the article was about how the Canadians are preparing to become independent, why Indians are still under the colonial masters. This, friends, became a basis for a prosecution for sedition. After that, you had Amba Prasad, in other case, again, all these cases really dealt with cases where people were trying to raise the protest and seek freedom and say that colonial masters should leave us and go and raise objections regarding their rule. But all these decisions gave rise to four different interpretations of the word disaffection. And as a result of this, the provision in 1898 is taken out and overhauled and put back again with three explanations to cover all these various categories of disaffection and it becomes much, much wider than it originally was. Post this amendment, we had the famous trials of Mahatma Gandhi. We had the trial of Bal Gangathar Tilak, the third trial, Annie Besant, Molana Abdul Kalam Azad, Sheikh Abdullah, and a number of other decisions came about. Finally, as the law progresses, we have two very important decisions. One is the fascinating decision by, Doc Chief, by Chief Justice Morris Guire in the federal court in 1942. He's the gentleman who set up the Delhi University as well. Sir so Morris Guire, and if any of you know Delhi University, Guire Hall is named after him. Sir so Morris Guire in 1942 looks at the interpretation of 124 in the past and says it's too wide. Unless there is an incitement to violence and unless the element of violence exists, words spoken by themselves, however strong, will not be enough. And therefore, he curtails the application of this provision. But this is not accepted by the Privy Council. And in 1947, the Privy Council in Sadashiv Bhare Rao's case goes back to the old interpretation and says words are good enough. We don't need acts of violence. We don't need an incitement to violence. Strong words, disapprobation, anger against the government is enough, and that should be enough to prosecute. Now, the 42 decision is very important, federal court decision, because the gentleman, Mr. Neharindu Dat Majumdar, was a member of the then Bengal Assembly. And what was his protest? His protest was that the governor, 
of West Bengal and the govern government of, West, of Bengal, not West Bengal, Bengal at that time, had acted in a negligent manner and had failed to respond properly to the Dhaka riots. And therefore, the concern that was raised was that the government having failed, he had criticized them in the strongest possible terms, but he'd done it as a legislator. And therefore, Sir Morris Quire, sitting in the federal court, took a view that that was not a case where sedition ought to be invoked. Now, after this, we reach a new point in our country where we reach independence in 1947. With independence in 1947, we have a constituent assembly and the constituent assembly takes up this debate on sedition. Please remember, most of the people who were in the constituent assembly had suffered during the freedom movement. Most of them had suffered one or the other form of persecution and prosecution. So they were very sensitive to the kind of offenses that ought to be brought in and the kind of expression that they wanted in the constitution and their fundamental rights chapter. So the draft constitution includes two important words. One is sedition. The other is public order. The word, both the words are put in there because the idea was to curtail freedom of speech and expression on certain specified grounds under Article 19. But the word sedition is dropped because the constitution makers were aware of how it had been misused in the past. Mr. K. Munshi, in his wonderful speech in the constitution assembly, says this, and I want to read that out for my young friends, for my friends here. A hundred and fifty years ago in England, holding a meeting, Conducting a procession was considered sedition. Even holding an opinion against which will bring ill will towards the government was considered sedition once. Our notorious section 124A of the penal code was sometimes construed so widely that I remember in a criticism of a district magistrate was urged to be covered by section 124A. But public opinion has changed considerably since now. And now that we have a democratic government, a line must be drawn between criticism of government which should be welcome and incitement which would undermine the security or order on which civilized life is based or which is calculated to overthrow the state. Therefore, the word sedition has been omitted. So Article 19.2 as enacted did not use the word sedition. This article gets challenged beautifully in the judgment initially in Ramesh Thapur's case, Ramesh Thapur versus Tamilad, 1950. Now, Ramesh Thapur's magazine Crossroads was for all practical purposes a communist uh, publication, and Mr. Thapur was his publisher. He wrote very strongly about the Madras government and the action taken by them, and as a result of this, there were actions being initiated. He filed a petition under Article 32 before the Supreme Court, and on 26th of May 1950, the court declared by its ruling the Madras Maintenance of Public Safety Act as unconstitutional. The majority ruling said that unless a law restricting freedom of speech is directly solely against undermining the security of the state or to overthrow it, such a law cannot fall within clause 2 of Article 19. Similarly, the Punjab High Court in Tara Singh's case dealt with two prosecutions which were lodged against him under 124A and other provisions. The issues were the validity of this provision. The petitioner challenged their validity and he succeeded. The court held that 124A had become unconstitutional and struck it down. The effect of these decisions was that the government of the day thought that it was time to amend the constitution. So we have the first amendment and see how it gets prompted. Firstly, Sardar Patel believed that Ramesh Thapur's judgment knocked the bottom out of sedition as an offense and there was no way to control the press. Secondly, Nehru writes to the then law minister, Sri Dr. B.R. Ambedkar, Baba Sahib Ambedkar, expressing with the view that the constitution needs to be amended to include the word public order in the restrictions under Article 19.2. So the Home Ministry was not willing to record the word reasonable, but Baba Sahib Ambedkar the great jurist that he was insisted on having that word and he was the law minister. 
and the bill gets passed by parliament with a majority vote and the first amendment empowers the government to impose, impose reasonable restrictions in the interest of, and I quote, public order. You would recall that the initial inclination, and this is quite disturbing because remember, the initial inclination of our leaders at that time, including Pandit Nehru, had been to outlaw certain kind of speeches because they felt that there were lots of too many questions perhaps being asked. It's always different when you're in government and when you're not. And the amendment made prosecution easier. However, the amendment brought in the word reasonable, which expanded the scope of judicial review. That is the ability to go to court and challenge such restrictions, such statutory restrictions. Now this is post the constitution and after the amendment, the offense of sedition then comes up before a constitution bench in Kedarnath Singh in 1962 Supreme Court. There is a challenge to its validity to section 124A and the court goes back and looks at the entire legislative history of section 124A and after examining it, takes a view that this is an offense which is now covered in terms of article 19.2 but chooses to read it down to make it very narrow. So unless there is an incitement to violence, unless there is a connection with violence, mere words are not going to be enough. And that is the locus classical, that is the classical decision in Kedar Nath Singh, where though they upheld the validity of the offense, the Supreme Court was very conscious that it should be applied in the most limited of cases, in what we would call the rarest of rare cases, because it should not become a mechanism for suppression of free speech and debate. Recently, in 2016, the Supreme Court was again faced with a petition by Common Cause, where Common Cause, which is a well-known PIL petitioner, said that we must bring in a mechanism in the law so that you can have senior officers determining whether such prosecutions ought to be launched or not. Now, what's happened is, in Common Cause, the court very wisely said, Kedarnath Singh settles the law, Kedarnath Singh ought to be followed and has left it at that and has given a direction to all functionaries of the state as they anyway had to follow, that Kedarnath Singh must be applied. We also have an interesting case of the late uh, Mr. Arun Jaitley. After the judgment, the NJAC judgment, you know, when the Supreme Court constitution been struck down, the amendment to the constitution by which the power to appoint judges was taken away from the Supreme Court Collegium and put in the hands of a separate committee under the statute. So the NJC judgment quashing the constitutional amendment and the statute uh, comes about. And Mr. Jetley wrote an article which was critical of the NJC decision in the strongest words. Amongst the things he said was that we have to have a balance between different limbs of government, whether it's the judiciary, whether it's parliament, and whilst, while they each has to be respected, Respect for parliaments and parliaments functions is very important and therefore he believed that the judgment was not a correct judgment and it was a criticism. There was a prosecution launched in the state of UP and he had to go to the High Court. He was then the finance minister where he succeeded in the quashment of the proceedings. Yet, recently, yet about the same time, there was a protest in Tamil Nadu by some students and some activists regarding the imposition of the national uh, entrance exam for medical examinations for, for MBBS and BDS. Now this was questioned and during that certain protests were raised, certain objections were raised. The Madras High Court, however, has upheld the FR and allowed the investigation to go on, which is a little, which is a disturbing sign because eventually people have the right to object to government functions. They have a right to object to what government says. And that is a prerogative of the citizen as long as it doesn't cross limits which are uh, what we would call offensive limits. We must also now hark back to sedition and its interplay with this freedom of speech and expression. In 1989, Ore Uru Gramathil was a movie made about the reservation policy. The Supreme Court in that judgment says, he, it upholds the grant of certificate and says, and I quote, open criticism of government policies and operations is not a ground for restricting, restricting expressions, unquote. 
Similarly, in the famous case of the actress S. Kushbu, who expressed his, uh, her views about premarital sex, the Supreme Court said, the free flow of ideas is very important and that is what makes a society better informed, which results into good governance. In the context of uh, cellular operators, the Supreme Court again upheld the, the right to freedom of speech and expression. And recently, in the application of RTI Act, the Supreme Court has said that the country being democratic, the right to criticize government can only be effectively undertaken if accounting, accountability and transparency are maintained in view of the same right to information is a corollary of the right to freedom of speech and expression. So therefore, friends, on the one hand, we have the offense of sedition. And on the other hand, we have this entire body of laws dealing with the right to freedom of speech and expression and expressing it in the widest possible terms. But the problem is practically that authorities continue repeatedly to use the provision of seditions often indiscriminately and it is not about an offense against the state but it is even an objection regard even if you talk about the conduct of an official or a functionary you can be prosecuted for that and that is leading to very unfortunate circumstances so even if recently there was an objection regarding the conduct of a civil servant in a district there was an invocation of sedition and these young activists who were protesting what they did was in Tamil Nadu and it's an interesting anecdote they found that the collector was not conducting himself properly so they put a donkey in front of the collector's office and started making their representations to the donkey saying that the collector doesn't seem to hear us perhaps the donkey will and for that the collector calls up the SP the SP of this district launches the prosecution and these people are running around facing remands we can you know it's it sounds amusing but it is so traumatic for the people who are put to such a prosecution for perhaps what may be a practical joke in an extreme but it just shows how thin-skinned we are as individuals now friends i will tell you that today this offense of sedition has been around for a long time it's been around for 150 years Yet, in the country of its birth, in the United Kingdom, in Great Britain, in 1977, the Law Commission said, there is no purpose to have it in a democratic society. Remember, that's a country which it has a monarchy. It's a constitutional monarchy without a written constitution. They don't have written fundamental rights, so they adopt the European, uh, they have a statute on fundamental rights now, but they don't have a written constitution. Yet, in Great Britain, the offense of sedition has been done away with. And I will tell you what was the reason behind this. And I'm going to read a little passage and I quote, sedition and seditious and defamatory libel are arcane offenses from a bygone era when freedom of expression wasn't seen as the right it is today. The existence of these obsolete offenses in this country had been used by other countries as justification for the retention of similar laws, which have been actively used to suppress political dissent and restrict press freedom. Abolishing these offenses will allow the UK to take a lead in challenging similar laws in other countries where they are used to express, suppress free speech. Therefore, when the British government, when the UK government, who brought this law into India to control the natives, all of us, have done away with it for their own country. And let me tell you, they were very particular about not applying it necessarily to all their people because they always applied it very narrow, very specifically and not in a general position, even a hundred years ago. Today, in an era where we have constitutional law, where we have a democratic government, the legitimate question arises, is sedition at all relevant when there are adequate provisions within the penal code, within other statutes, to deal with extreme acts, violent acts against the state. Those may be punishable, but not just spoken or written words. The press is the fourth leg of democracy. By sedition, you control the press. But today we have a fifth limb of democracy. We have social media.
today the dissemination of information over social media, though sometimes not necessarily accurate, is so deep and vast that we are not dependent on the traditional mechanisms of information, which is electronic media or print media. Therefore, in today's date and age, sedition is definitely not a legitimate offense to be retained on the statute book and it requires a serious rethink. I must also tell you that the Law Commission of India looked at this issue in 2018, raised certain very valid questions, but in the meantime, their term ended and they could not take it forward. You have all seen the decision under section, in relation to section 66A of the Information Technology Act by Justice Nariman. And it's a beautiful decision which deals with, which is titled Shreya Single versus Unit of India. Justice Shalameshwar and Justice Nariman who penned that decision talk about the need to have freedom of speech and how curtailment of free speech is not permissible and how the provision was wide. Now it was posted on the ground that they felt it was too wide, but you must also see the principle and the philosophy that they expound in that decision. And that is very important. We are of course facing a situation where a constitution bench of the Supreme Court five judges have upheld the validity of the provision. So if it is ever challenged, it'll have to go to seven unless there is an amendment of the provision and I don't see any government doing it. It's not been done since 1947. And I don't see it easily happening in my lifetime. But we can always hope and I can always assume that one of our colleagues here will be one of the great challengers who will make this little nasty little provision go away. I will end by quoting Alexander Pope. And I quote, how small a part of that human heart endure, the part that laws or kings can cause or cure. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir, for that uh, elaborate uh, explanation on the laws. I will be opening the floor for certain questions. Uh, all of the uh, listeners who want to pose questions to the speaker, I'd request you to mention the same on the group chat, and we can take them up bit by bit. Yeah, if you can, if, if you can be kind enough to tell me the questions, you don't need to read them out, or, you, or one of you can just keep telling me the read out the relevant questions and the speakers and the uh, queries name and I will answer them one by one because or if you want I can start reading them one by one and then my fear is that I may end up missing a lot. Uh, we'll mention the names of the people. If you want to, if, if they want their name mentioned, I have no difficulty. <laughs> All right. Uh, the first question, should I read out the question? I must tell you, this is a very interesting question. Yeah. Which I must answer from one Mr. Weber. Uh, Merely misuse of a provision of law, can it be a reason to strike it down? The answer is no, it cannot be a reason to strike it down. However, and I must say this, however, what is important to be seen is, is the law in consonance with our understanding of the right of freedom of speech and expression in the year 2020? 1962 was a different environment. Today, we are a much more open society. Today, we are exchanging thoughts at a much greater rate. Everybody is a, not even an amateur journalist. I would say everybody is now almost like a professional journalist because we are posting information, we are absorbing information. There is a barrage of information. It's not just the information age. It's an information revolution with an uh, overuse of social media perhaps to disseminate thoughts. We may or may not agree with them, but we have access to that. Therefore, in today's day and age, can this colonial anachronism be allowed to exist? And that's the question which I'm posing to all my friends here. Right. Uh, so let's start the questions. So there's a question coming in which states, could you state the position of the foreigners as regards to fundamental rights under Article 19. Is Article 19 violative of Article 14 to the limited extent of discrimination against non-citizens in this regard? Article 19 definitely is limited to citizens. And the fact is it, it does not apply. Unlike Article 21 and Article 14 is distinct. But 
because of Menika Gandhi's decision where all of them have to be read together, today it's a valid piece of legislation. That position may have to be revisited whether 19.2 can be uh, questioned, I must, and, and 19 itself can be questioned on the ground that it does not give non-citizens rights. But as I see it, and I'm telling this from a practical point of view, we are now moving from a global world to, into a world of, of greater protectionism. And one of that is possibly going to be medical reasons. So in the near future, I don't see it being the medical security, the physical security of their own nationals. And that is why you see a ceiling of borders. Otherwise, if 192 was not to exist, then people would say there is free movement and you can't restrict us from movement. In fact, one of the problems that has arisen, perhaps in Europe, is because of no borders, the transmission of this disease, this pandemic, has been greater, has been great in Europe. And remember, they have really advanced medical and health care systems. So today, in today's environment, I don't see it being revisited and purely for practical reasons. Maybe in your lifetimes, yes, maybe, no, I don't see it in my lifetime. Uh, all right, sir. that was uh, definitely coming on to the time aspect. Okay, the next question is, uh, is there any perceptible interface between the UAPA and sedition? Okay, very interesting question. Uh, the UAPA deals with unlawful activities. The UAPA deals with uh, terrorist activities. There is an interplay between both membership of an unlawful association or performance of unlawful acts is an offense. And that is an over that kind of, uh, there's an overlap between that and the offense of sedition. There is also a 1907 or 1900 Criminal Law Amendment Act. I would recommend you have a look at that also. That's also an interesting piece of legislation. But having said that, I must add, the UAP Act was uh, to deal with unlawful activities. That's a 1967 le uh, legislation. It then gets amended in 2004 when POTA goes out. They bring in a lot of the terrorist provisions into the UAPA and amended, and then again it gets amended in 2008 when you have the NIA Act coming in. So these have now become scheduled offenses under the NIA Act. So as I was saying, there is an overlap definitely. And one of my arguments for doing away with sedition is that because there are existing specific provisions which deal with acts which may lead to violence or acts in relation to unlawful organizations or associations or terrorist organizations or scheduled terrorist organizations or terrorist gangs as the case may be. Why do we need sedition at all? Understandable. Uh, there's a, a question coming in from one of my friends and states, uh, what is the parameter, if there is any, to measure any word as offensive against the established government by law? The only parameters are in uh, Kedarnath Singh's case, and I would ask to visit that judgment. That's the locus, that's the classical judgment on the point. But mere slogan shouting, if I remember in Balwan Singh in 1995, the gentleman was standing at a street corner and shouting slogans of Khalistan Zindabad. He was prosecuted and they said that's not enough. Similarly, in uh, Bilal Ahmed Kalu, he was slanging, standing in Srinagar and raising slogans, and that was held not to constitute. Uh, Understand. So it have to be seen on a case by case basis, but the broad principles of when it applies are laid down in Kedarnath Singh, which remains good law. Definitely. Uh, there's another question which states that uh, uh, since you mentioned that there is an essential overlap between what's in account for and what uh, other provisions exist under the IPC and various other acts. Uh, could we run through a list of such uh, offenses under the IPC and other acts that uh, take into account what sedition entails? Well, I'll tell you broadly from my recollection, under the IPC, you would like to look at offenses which deal with violence. Plus, you know, if you cause injury, there are murder, hurt, etc. provisions. That's the hurt provisions from, as well as murder, culpable homicide. Then you have 153A, 153B, 
you have 505, you have 295A, uh, uh, you have uh, provisions for waging war, conspiracy to wage war, gathering, gathering offenses to wage war, which are all in chapter six of the penal code where sedition exists, which is offenses under section 121 to 124. So then you have the Unlawful Activities Act. These are prosecutable under the, uh, the National Investigation Agency Act. A large body of law, therefore, exists. And that body of law makes it possible to deal with specific cases of acts against the state. There is a whole chapter. There are, chap there are other chapters also against, of, uh, because remember, uh, uh, in the IPC itself, chapter six has a title of offenses against the state. So we don't need to look very far. Definitely. Um, uh, keeping in mind the one uh, uh, aspect that uh, multiple judgments have highlighted regarding sedition, that uh, if it is uh, targeted in such a manner that it could incite hatred and uh, civil unrest, then that would, to a certain extent, tantamount to sedition. Keeping in this principle in mind, uh, there was a recent judgment of the Karnataka High Court on the bail plea of certain Kashmiri students who were booked under sedition for sharing a video which had a Pakistan Zindabad song of some manner. Uh, it is read that the act of the students may disturb Indian social fabric. That was the prosecution statement that uh, made it into account. In the light of this, the bail was denied to those students. Would sharing such a video constitute sedition? And does public conscience and public morality hold any water in regards to sedition? I'm going to duck that question for a specific reason because not in that, but in other case, I'm a prosecutor with similar facts. So I'm going to duck that one. <laughs> that definitely understandable. I hope you understand. <laughs> definitely. Okay, moving on to the next one then. Uh, in today's time, when walls don't only have ears, they have Twitter accounts too. That is someone writes. What mechanism might detriment the people from expressing anything and everything they might think of, if not sedition that reprimands them? Well, frankly, uh, all the social media platforms make you sign a policy which most people don't look at which requires you to adhere to Indian laws. So never forget that. You can, if, the, if it is informed to the social media website or platform that you are in breach of Indian laws or an action is launched, you can have your account shut off. And you can also, and the prosecution under the specific statute whether the sedition or otherwise doesn't go away. So the question today is, we have a right of freedom of speech and expression. It has now reached a level of expression of dissemination, which was hitherto unknown. That being the position, can we now retain sedition in its current form where it is applicable so randomly across the board? Do we need to refine it? Do we need to do away with it? Or do we need to take it away completely? So these are issues that will arise, and this is uh, this is in the context of uh, whether it be Twitter, whether it be Instagram, whether it be Facebook, whether it be WhatsApp. All of these raise a question as to the the ability to disseminate. And then again, please remember, the Constitution Bench also says the Nine Judges Bench in Puttaswamy says we have a right to privacy of our communications. Definitely. There are a number of there are a number of issues which will eventually be debated as and when perhaps you file the challenge. <laughs> Definitely, sir. Uh, as a last resort, uh, in terms of uh, keeping sedition as an offence, uh, I'd go back to the same principle again regarding public order. Uh, there have been a very sparse number of judgments that have defined as to what is the ambit of uh, public order per se. So can an argument be sustained that uh, the interpretation of public order has been quite arbitrary in that regard and hence does not sustain? Indeed, the this, look, I think uh, the argument against public order may not necessarily stand because it has been dealt with in the cases of terrorism. Call Kartar Singh deals with, as I recall, deals with public order at some length. So the public order argument may not really be a valid ground to question sedition unless you take those to larger benches and get that whole argument upset. But 
again misuse of a provision or is not enough and there is an existing view which is upheld public order as it stands can we better it can we further subclassify it perhaps yes perhaps that would narrow down its scope to a point where it where offenses arising out of public order uh, concerns can be specific and limited but then we can always do that by limiting the offenses itself Definitely. it's not that public order has got that wide an interpretation by the court that it needs to be taken away but yes there is definitely an argument to be made that what was introduced in the first amendment to the constitution may need to be revisited definitely definitely that can be taken into account i'll be moving on to the final question uh, for today owing to the paucity of time and this is a, a larger picture question i feel the question states uh, how does the culture of authority as was endorsed by adm jabal for play out in this regard in this whole sedition i i didn't your voice was not clear yeah uh, the question states how does the culture of authority that was endorsed by the adm jabalpur judgment how does it play out in this regard in the sedition argument fortunately adm jabalpur is no longer good law it just took the supreme court 40 years to do away with it which is not a very long time in the history of a country is it only 40 years though it had been diluted time and again and it had really been made redundant there is a definite concern about the culture of authority but we will have to find a balance between the exercise of authority the existence and exercise of authority in our elected representatives and our government and the rights of the citizen that balance is unfortunately in practice not found and we have to work towards ensuring greater transparency in governance at every level my personal view is that the covid in the post covid era is going to be a great game changer our resort to technology is going to lead to the debate about the ethics of use of technology because technology is a tool for, which can be positively used yet it's also a tool which can be used to curb dissent but having said that the use of technology coupled with transparency and yet specifying acts which should uh, be brought within the ambit of criminal law will be the way forward one of the biggest concerns i have about the indian state is and if you look back historically from the 1980 onwards every time the indian state believes that there is an issue which needs to be addressed the indian state reacts by bringing in more and more conduct within the ambit of criminal law take for example negotiable instruments act it has besieged the system check bouncing and besieged the system it's not really a criminal offense there is a concern whether matrimonial offenses have to be revisited as criminal as criminal law or whether the civil actions in these have to be made more efficacious you even taken matrimonial offenses and put them under the act of domestic violence so that magistrates can try them and this kind of harmony creates more disharmony perhaps i'm not saying that matrimonial offenses need to go please don't misunderstand that understand me saying that but i think we need to have a re serious rethink and overhaul of the number of legislations that have been brought in the domain of criminal law provisions that have been brought in the domain of criminal law at least in the context of commercial establishments and commercial law the government is looking at it but it has to be done across the board okay. and decriminalization is the way forward we need to get rid of offenses which are redundant take for example section 377 of the ipc the high court dilutes it the supreme court upsets it the petitions were pending finally a constitution bench struck it down but how long did it take it's an offense which came into our statute book in 1870 1860 and an offense which has no relationship 
with India because this was brought in from which was brought in. Uh, it was in uh, in part of ecclesiastical law in Great Britain, and it was again brought in because the British believed that the native the Indians' uh, personal sexual habits were not appropriate based on their standards of Victorian morality. So it has taken us over 150 years in court to do away with such provisions. Before we go further, we've revisited the IPC many times. It's actually a very good piece of legislation. But offenses which have fallen into, fall into disuse, destitute, or offenses which are no longer relevant in a democratic society definitely need to be revisited. And the acts, not only the penal code, but every one of our criminal legislations needs to be re-looked at and streamlined and maybe even removed from the ambit of criminal. Definitely, sir. Um, we, we definitely have a lot of discussion and debate that's pending in this regard. Uh, on that note, uh, I'd like to thank you and uh, we're really indebted for sharing your insights on this issue. I'd like to hand over the mic to Siddharth, sir, for the closing words on this. So. I would just like to say thanks a lot, sir. Firstly, for accepting the request for coming on the platform and addressing uh, the audience. You must have noted that we at the peak, we had touched an audience of 290, most of which 80% of which were students. The happier part of it is that uh, most of these students are those students whom we are in touch with from various national universities or premier law schools. And we have been sending them emails relentlessly to, in fact, twice or thrice we send them emails, spam their inbox to attend this session. And uh, it really gives us a pleasure that you come between us and keep enlightening us with these, uh, I would say, pearls of wisdom. Thanks a lot, sir. Well, Siddharth, I would only say, don't, you, don't use strong measures against your students. It's again a question of freedom of choice and a freedom of expression and, a free, and the right to hear or not to hear. We can't yes. force them to hear us, can we? Yes. <laughs> Thank you once again. My pleasure. Thank, okay. you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much.